Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Emily Sue. And I'm Raymond Yang. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Bar Association deals blow to CY Learn by warning him not to rule out civil nomination in political reform report. Occupy Central threatens to start campaign with strikes and schools and businesses as early as this month. Palestinian death toll in Israeli airstrikes tops 100 as U.S. offers to broker ceasefire. The Bar Association has warned the government not to ignore widespread calls for ordinary voters to be allowed to name candidates in the next chief executive election. It's a big blow for the government, which has cited the Bar's submission on political reform in declaring that civil nomination violates the basic law. The association today accused the government of quoting it out of context and insisted there are ways to include the concept of civil nomination. Chief Executive Leung Chen Ying had nothing to say to the media today, but the Bar Association dealt him a blow just before the government unveils its report on political reform next Tuesday. Leung and his officials have cited the stance of Hong Kong's barristers in ruling out civil nomination for the next chief executive election on the grounds that allowing ordinary voters to name candidates goes against the basic law. But after mobilizing its members to march against Beijing's white paper on Hong Kong's autonomy last month, the bar issued a clarification today, accusing the government of taking its submission on electoral reform out of context during the public consultation. The association warned it would be irresponsible of the government to reject our proposal or recommend that Beijing reject it solely because it does not comply with the basic law. The bar urged the government to explore the rationale and underlying objective of any proposals with strong public support and see if they could be achieved through alternative methods in compliance with the law. It noted that the purpose of civil nomination is to ensure maximum participation of the general electorate in the nomination process, and it's perfectly capable of being accommodated within the concept of the nomination committee that the basic law specifies as the sole authority to name candidates. They warned that if the administration ignores a popular proposal solely on the ground of doing things according to the basic law, then it's a misuse and abuse of the concept of the rule of law. So I think this is a very timely uh, statement made by the Hong Kong Bar Association in retaliation of uh, the Hong Kong SAR government making use of only part of the earlier statement uh, to serve its own purposes. And it is almost uh, to the point of alleging intellectual dishonesty on the part of the SAR government. Oh, uh, Just as Secretary Rimsky Yun uh, denied quoting the bar out of context, context. saying today's statement did not contradict the government's stand. Uh, and he promised that all public views, including the bars, will be reflected other, in the government's uh, report. The leaders of the Occupy Central campaign are threatening strikes at schools, universities and businesses over the next couple of weeks if the ministers in charge refuse to meet them before the government unveils its report on political reform next Tuesday. The civil disobedience movement could start its mass blockade of Central as early as next month if Beijing decides not to allow ordinary voters to name candidates in the next chief executive election. What you got? One of Occupy Central's core leaders, Chu Yuming, took to the airwaves this morning to talk about what's next for the controversial civil disobedience campaign. A showdown between authorities and pro-democracy groups is looming, with the government set to unveil its long-awaited report on political reform next Tuesday. Reverend Chu has asked to meet with the three government ministers in charge of constitutional development before the report is out. He stressed the need to explain to them in person about the public views expressed in the newly 800,000 ballots collected during Occupy Central's unofficial referendum on universal suffrage last month. The government has already made it clear that its report will be based on feedback collected during a five-month consultation that ended in May. That means it will not reflect the overwhelming calls for genuine universal suffrage expressed during the referendum and the July 1st mass rally. But Chief Executive Leung Chunying has the option to include that in his own report to Beijing. Chu warned that if government officials rejected or ignored his request for a meeting, Occupy Central would start hitting back as early as this month, beginning with non-cooperative acts such as strikes in schools, universities and businesses. The National People's Congress Standing Committee will make its own recommendations on what direction electoral reform should take after studying the government's and chief executive's reports in August. Chu warned that if the MPC does not allow genuine universal suffrage for the 2017 chief executive election, 
his group will go ahead next month with a full-scale street blockade of Central. He and his co-organizers are prepared to be arrested before that, and they've already recruited backup organizers, as well as a team of legal professionals to help. They've also drafted contingency plans in case the protesters run out of food, and a medical team will be on standby. The government will have its hands full, with student groups planning to launch their own civil disobedience campaigns to press for greater democracy. In a related development today, Chu and another priest, Reverend Kwok Nai Wang, joined the chorus of criticism against Anglican church leader Paul Kwong. Archbishop Kwong has caused a storm by accusing those who took part in the July 1st rally of a herd mentality and suggesting they stay silent, just as Jesus did before his crucifixion. The archbishop also suggested mockingly that students who were arrested for staging a sit-in on Chater Road following the mass rally should have brought their domestic helpers with them, instead of complaining they were not given any food by police. I think this is very serious because, I, to, to me, I think he insulted the students who put their career online just to, to, just to hope that Hong Kong have, have a better future. I think in facing injustice, I think everybody should speak up, particularly Christians. Kwok urged Kwong to come out and apologize for his remarks, instead of relying on other church figures for damage control. A group of protesters led by radical lawmaker Leung Kwok Hong took it a step further today with a protest outside St. John's Cathedral in Central. They put up signs at the church doors demanding that the archbishop quit his job. The government is urging lawmakers to pass a double stamp duty bill before their summer recess. But while opposition legislators have decided not to filibuster it, their pro-business colleagues are trying to amend it. Financial Secretary John Zeng dismissed their criticism that is hurting Hong Kong's competitive edge. But critics of the bill have plenty to say today. ATV's Arthur Urquiola reports. Lawmakers this morning continued with the second reading of the controversial double stamp duty bill which the administration is scrambling to get passed before the legislature breaks for the summer. The government rolled out the measure in February last year, doubling the highest rate of stamp duty from 4.25 percent to 8.5 percent to curb speculation and cool soaring property prices. Four months before that, it announced a 15 percent buyer stamp duty on non-locals and companies buying property and increase the special stamp duty for sellers to as much as 20 percent on property sold within three years of their purchase. While the measures are already in effect, the relevant legislation still needs to be passed. But the lawmaker representing the real estate sector today accused the government of covering up for the fact that it had failed to supply enough land to meet housing demand. Continuously creating imaginary enemies and then fighting them won't resolve our housing problems or help Hong Kong people purchase a home. The administration has stirred up a harness nest, while at the same time ignoring the genuine mismatch between demand and supply of residential properties. Sheck declared the government had failed because property transactions have dropped by more than 40 percent, while prices have actually gone up by 35 percent. You have been successful in bringing down the the uh, uh, transactions, but not on the prices, nor increase the number of Hong Kong people owing Hong Kong flats. The DSD make it worse, and even to the extent that you have interfered into the business sector, affecting a lot of the SME. Pro-business groups want the bill to exempt companies buying commercial property. The Liberal Party's James Tian complained that investors from Europe and the U.S. were not coming here because the bill worked against them. His party is supporting any amendments to water down the bill, saying in the long run it goes against free market principles. Andrew Lung from the Business and Professionals Alliance pointed out that genuine home buyers might want to upgrade to larger flats, but are worried they may not be able to sell off their smaller flats. He added that because of this, first-time home buyers have more difficulties getting into the market. But DAB lawmaker Starry Lee insisted the stabilizing effect was necessary, and Lechko should not send out the wrong message. She called on filibustering lawmakers to stop stalling proceedings and make sure the stamp duty bill is passed before summer recess begins next week.
Financial Secretary John Sung also urged lawmakers to pass the bill, insisting that denying exemptions for commercial property buyers will not hurt the city's competitive edge. We have always indicated that this is an interim measure. This is not a permanent measure. This is something that we needed to deal with the current situations that we say that we that we're facing. So there is really not an issue that this would hurt our competitive in the long in the longer term. So I don't agree with uh, what, what some of these members are saying. Radical lawmakers have agreed to change their stalling tactics as they support the property cooling measures and don't want to block the double stamp duty bill with their filibustering. The bill is expected to be passed within the next week, but they have vowed to continue slowing down the passage of other bills. The second reading will resume on Monday. Arthur Urquiola, ATV News. Lawmakers are making painfully slow progress at LegCo's Finance Committee as they try to clear a backlog of government funding requests before the summer break. Officials admitted that funding for urgent livelihood matters may not be passed on time. The government yesterday refused to reshuffle its agenda and fast-track funding requests for livelihood policies that have been held up by filibustering lawmakers on the Finance Committee. That set the stage for more bickering today, as the committee met with the aim of clearing as many items as possible from the backlog of 39 pending approval. So they started by arguing over an extra $800 million for the construction of a third hotel at Hong Kong Disneyland. The funding vote was eventually passed, but that alone took nearly two hours of debate, with only eight hours of meeting time scheduled for tomorrow before LegCo goes on summer break. It was not looking good for urgent funding requests, such as for pension and old age payments, the low income family subsidy, and a pay rise for civil servants. Labour Secretary Matthew Cheung admitted he was not optimistic, although he refused to give up hope. But there was a further indication of trouble ahead when half a dozen Cheung Kwan O residents held a noisy protest outside Lechko this afternoon. Led by Sai Kung District Councillor Christine Fong, the group protested against the government's funding request for expanding the city's three landfills. They poured a keg of red liquid symbolizing blood over Fong to liken the government's plan to murdering residents living near the landfill. The funding application is expected to be filibustered again when it's debated tomorrow afternoon. Overseas, the Palestinian debt toll from Israeli airstrikes on the Gaza Strip has topped 100 as Israel prepares a ground invasion. While Palestinian -led leaders have urged their people to evacuate border towns, the U.S. has offered to border a ceasefire. ATV's Ben O'Rourke reports. Palestinian militant group Al-Quds Brigades released this video of rockets being fired at Israel from the Gaza Strip. Mobile phone footage shot in Jerusalem showed people slowly taking cover as sirens wailed across the city. The Israeli army managed to intercept two rockets, but others got through, causing minor damage. Another rocket hit a petrol station in the southern city of Ashdod, causing a large fire. In response, the Israelis launched more airstrikes, including this one on Hamas militants in a car. Medical officials in Gaza said a doctor was among the dead after last night's attacks. The airstrikes continued as rescuers tried to recover the victims in Rafah. Dozens of Palestinians have been killed in airstrikes since three Israeli students were kidnapped and killed in the West Bank and Jewish extremists burnt a Palestinian teenager to death in a shocking revenge attack. Most of the Palestinian casualties are innocent civilians, many of them women and children, but Hamas rocket attacks have given Israel all the justification it needs for its deadly crackdown. The tit-for-tat escalation has reached the point where an Israeli assault on Gaza looks almost certain, with tanks massing along the border and Tel Aviv calling up thousands of army reservists. So far, the battle is progressing as planned, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told his people overnight. We have hit Hamas and the terrorist organizations hard, and we will increase our strikes on them. Sensing an imminent onslaught, Palestinian Prime Minister Mahmoud Abbas warned people living along border areas to leave home and move inland. 
clashes also continued late into the night in the occupied West Bank, with Palestinian youths throwing stones at Israeli soldiers armed with tear gas, stun grenades and rubber bullets. On another front, there are reports of militants in Lebanon firing at least one rocket into Israel, raising the prospect of a broader Middle East conflict. With the situation seemingly doomed to get even worse, the U.S. is said to be ready to step in to help, according to the White House. President Barack Obama is said to have told Netanyahu in a phone call that Washington is prepared to facilitate a cessation of hostilities. Obama also condemned the Palestinian rocket attacks. Ben O'Rourke, ATV News. Environmental activists held a protest against landfill expansion plans by dumping garbage bags outside government headquarters today. They urged the government to tackle waste at the source instead. ATV's Anne Chang was there. There was a small mountain of blue bin bags piled up outside government headquarters at Tamar today. Environmental activists who dumped the bag there said they represented public opposition to government plans to expand Hong Kong's three landfills and build an incinerator off Lantau. The activists from Greener's Action urged the government to tackle rubbish at the source instead of seeking LegCo funding for schemes opposed by the public. So many people to urge the government to uh, do the right, uh, right thing, do the right job about the uh, uh, waste reduction. But uh, however, we regret the government didn't uh, respond to environmental groups. Greener's action cited the results of a poll it conducted in Tuen Moon, the site of one of the landfills. It asked locals how they think their garbage should be handled and asked them to vote by disposing of their trash in one of two colored bags yellow for the government's waste reduction plans, and blue for tackling waste at the source. Of the 440 people who voted, 70 percent chose the blue trash bags. Mainly, uh, we want to extend the uh, producer responsibility schemes to uh, different items. We all want to uh, they implement uh, the uh, waste charging by households uh, policies. And we also want the uh, government to um, review about the construction waste uh, charging in landfill. And uh, we also want uh, government to, um, to create and promote the Hong Kong recycling industry. The people of Hong Kong have spoken and they'd rather cut rubbish at its source than have more landfills. Whether or not the government will listen is another matter as it seems determined to push on with its course. Anne Chang, ATV News. Rescue workers have recovered the bodies of 11 people, eight of them children, after their school bus plunged into a pond at a remote village in central China yesterday. The overloaded minibus was not discovered until hours later, and the recovery efforts took until early this morning. ATV's Winner Wong reports. A crowd gathered to watch as rescue workers fished out the school bus from the pond in Gansi village in central China's Hunan province. The minibus was only meant to seat seven people, but there were 11 people on board when it plunged into the water at around 5 p.m. yesterday. Eight children, two teachers and the driver died in the accident. The kindergarten students were heading home from school when the bus swerved off the road. Rescue teams did not learn of the accident until much later because the location was so remote. It was 3 a.m. by the time the bus was pulled out of the water with the bodies of the eight children and driver inside. The teachers were found about an hour later. <laughs> There were several other children on board, but they got off before the accident happened, said Liu Hai Hong, father of one of the young victims. He said the bus began its journey with about 14 or 15 children. Investigators said the driver was new to his job and not familiar with his route. Accidents involving overcrowded school buses are common in China, and every major one sparks fresh calls for improved safety. In 2011, then-Premier Wen Jiabao promised more government funds to improve school bus services after 18 children were killed when a bus slammed into their overloaded vehicle in northwestern China. Wen Wang, ATV News. Courts in China's troubled Xinjiang region jailed 32 people today, some of them for life for inciting terrorism over the Internet. It's part of an ongoing crackdown on extremism following a string of terror attacks blamed on Muslim separatists. Here's Wen Wang. 
hands cuffed and heads shaved, the 32 suspects were marched into courtrooms across Xinjiang today to hear their punishment. Three of the men were given life sentences, while the 29 others got terms ranging from 4 to 15 years. The mainland courts tried the men in 11 cases of posting videos and audio clips online to inspire terrorism. Authorities say they encouraged others to join terrorist organizations, created guides on how to make explosives, and incited ethnic hatred and discrimination. They were said to have helped fuel a string of bloody attacks in the volatile Xinjiang region, which Beijing has blamed on Islamist separatists. The most recent was in May when a bomb went off inside a market in the capital, Urumqi. Mainland media claims all the attackers were exposed to extremist content online. Today's sentencings were part of a government crackdown launched on the 20th of June to wipe extremist content off the Internet. So far, 400 people have been arrested. Winna Wong, ATV News. Time now for sports with Bo Lan. So what do you have for us tonight, Bo? Well, it's a mixed bag of golf and football. But first, cycling, Andre Greipel has won the sixth stage of the Tour de France. Day six of the Tour de France took riders on a 194-kilometre journey from Arras to Rams. But many riders struggled with the wet and windy conditions, which caused small splits in the peloton. German Marcel Kittel found himself falling behind in the final five kilometers, and his compatriot Andre Greipel took the advantage in the final sprint. Greipel surged ahead of Alexander Kristoff and Samuel de Moulin to clinch his first victory of this year's race. Vincenzo Nobali followed the pack and managed to retain a two second lead in the overall standings, ahead of teammate Jakob Fusang. Peter Sagan is 44 seconds behind in third. Northern Irishman Rory McIlroy got off to a great start in the opening round of the Scottish Open. Battling windy conditions at Royal Aberdeen, McIlroy sank eight birdies and made just one bogey. He finished the day with a course record of seven under 64. Swede Christopher Brober and Ricardo Gonzalez of Argentina are just one stroke behind on 65. Defending champion Phil Mickelson carded an eagle, two birdies and one bogey to finish at three under 68. In football, Brazil's golden boy Neymar broke down in tears as he spoke about the challenge that ended his World Cup. Colombia's Juan Sugniga need the 22-year-old in the back, fracturing a vertebrae during Brazil's 2-1 quarter-final win. The injury ruled him out of the tournament before Brazil's humiliating 7-1 defeat against Germany. God blessed me. If it had been another two centimetres, I could have been in a wheelchair today, he claimed. Neymar said that Suniga called him the next day to apologize, but he stopped short of forgiving the Colombian for the challenge. The footballer also revealed that he will support Brazil's biggest rival, Argentina, in the World Cup final on Sunday. A look at the weather before we go. It was mainly cloudy with isolated showers and thunderstorms today. It was also very hot with some sunshine in the afternoon. Temperatures range from 26.8 to 32.2 degrees, while the relative humidity was between 72 and 97 percent. Winds were light to moderate coming in from the south. Let's check on the ultraviolet reading. The maximum recorded for the day was 11. Tomorrow's UV index will be around 11 as well. Now for a look at the weather in the region. A southerly air stream is bringing showers and hot conditions to the coast of Guangdong. And now the satellite images. It's mainly fine over parts of southern China. Here's what we can expect over the next few days. There'll be more showers and thunderstorms tomorrow, but there should be some sunny periods. Temperatures will range from 27 to 32 degrees. Sunshine and showers in the following couple of days. Here are the latest pollution readings under the Air Quality Health Index. General stations are at 2 to 3, meaning the health risk is low. Roadside levels are at 3 to 4, so the health risk is low to moderate.